right here. Three, two, one. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. first 
week uh, session, which starts January 11th. I'm not sure it's going to be that week, but it will be that first part of the week. So um, as you see, uh, senators or representatives signing on to the bill, I think it's really important that the community reaches out and thanks them in the just via an email. They don't have to call. You can call if you like, but um, at least just giving them thank you for signing on to the bill and continue to watch that and also continue to try to find more sponsors. The more you have, the merrier. And the more you have uh, allows that uh, vote when it comes time for committee to um, get a, a positive and majority uh, vote. So I'm really pleased that once I had heard uh, that this is something that was a priority. I feel it's a priority also. Um, the Asian American community in my district is second only in, in population, only to Broward. Uh, and Broward is number one. But I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're dispersed all over the state of Florida, but uh, we're going to need to have everybody participate and everyone acknowledge. Uh, how important this uh, project and for you and the bill for us is going to be. And we just have a long road to go because after we have two more committees after the first committee before it even gets to the floor. So, you know, we had a special session that interrupted our flow <laughs> of the committee week. So we are behind about a week or so, but we're hoping to catch up and get this through rapidly. With your help, we can do this. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Stewart. And now I would like to introduce Representative Ed Kamani, who is surprising us here in person in the flesh. He was supposed to be on the screen, so we're super excited to have you here. Representative Ed Kamani. Oh, can you get around for me real quick? I have had a chance to work with Nick Chan for a few years now, and of course, when I the tragedy in Atlanta happened, um, we're going to begin to conspire because uh, we know that the API community has been neglected and, and ignored for a very long time, not only as a political force, but just as everyday people. And the contributions and stories of the API community is something that we have to amplify and integrate into our curriculum. And again, my name is Ana Escamani. I'm the proud daughter of immigrants, uh, born and raised in Orlando. My parents came from two parts of Iran but met each other in Orlando. And I just share in so much love and solidarity with the immigrant experience as a first generation kid myself. Um, I know that when I was growing up in Orlando, I never saw the stories of, of, of my family in textbooks. I never saw the stories of the contributions that folks from other parts of the world have made in Florida. And now as an elected official, uh, much like Senator Linda Stewart, I'm proud to represent um, a thriving and diverse community, which also includes the Mill Safety Corridor, where we have Little Saigon, which is our uh, corridor of API businesses. Uh, of course, there's also uh, businesses throughout Central Florida, but I think for us, it's, it's very important that we also amplify every type of person who calls Central Florida home. And a part of that is ensuring that your contributions, contributions of your ancestors, are, are, are felt among the, the, the people of this state. And knowledge is power. And we know there's been so much disinformation and misinformation traveling within all of our communities. And of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it was amplified. But let's be real, that type of misinformation and, and racially driven comments have existed for a long time. I think this past year, we felt it more. But it, many of us, especially our elders, have not been um, strangers to this. And so it's time for us to do something about it. And we're really proud that with the bill that we filed, um, House Bill 281, yesterday we got our first Republican co-sponsor, uh, which is a really big deal in the Florida House, to be clear, the Florida House, if you're not, if you don't follow state politics, uh, it's been a very polarizing time. And so in the Florida legislature, to have a Republican co-sponsor our bill, represented by Beltran from the Tampa Bay area, is, is a really special thing. And oftentimes it's that, uh, that catalyst that also attracts other members from both parties to join us. So. Uh, much like Senator Linda Stewart, we've had some great conversations uh, with leadership on the House side. And so I'm very hopeful you know, we'll get a similar commitment of the bill hearing. Uh, we are setting up a meeting with the Department of Education next. And so we're having all those conversations, but your help is so needed because lawmakers need to hear from their constituents. And so for those who are in this room or those watching virtually, if you haven't already contacted your state representative to talk about this bill, ask them to co sponsor this bill, that's 
really, really, really important. Um, it makes a difference. And so don't think your voice in this process doesn't matter. Thank you so much, Representative. Good morning. Um, I just want to read a few words uh, from Sheriff John Nina, who couldn't be here but wanted to send a message. So his message is Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have made important contributions to our nation, and those contributions should be included as students learn about our country's rich history. Our diversity makes us stronger. I fully support AAPI history inclusion in our education curriculum, Sheriff John Mina. So we thank him for his support. And now we'd like to get started with our amazing panel, which I'm going to introduce you all to uh, one at a time. And I am going to let them share their acronyms of their organizations, which will help me so greatly. First, we have Amy Akamine from NAP. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Amy, for the introduction. And thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Uh, NAP is the National Association of Asian American Professionals. It's been around since 1982, with over 30 um, in 30 cities in the United States and in Canada, with about 20,000 members. Um, our mission and our goal is to be the premier um, leader leadership organization for the AAPI community. Uh, one area that we really focus in on is mentorship to students from middle school all the way to college. So what you two are putting together and putting forth in um, the state is really means a lot to us as an organization, but as well as to all of us in the community. Me personally, I am a first uh, generation American. My parents immigrated after World War II from um, Okinawa. Uh, and so uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, lived here in Central Florida now for 13 years. And my son has actually gone through the uh, entire K through 12 program in Soto County, and now he's a college student. Uh, over it. Yes, he made it. <laughs> so um, I just want to say that um, for me growing up in the United States, to have uh, not have what you are proposing um, really, I think, may, uh, will make a big difference for those who will have it if it is successful and going through. So just, again, I want to commend both of you. We have now. My question to you is that the Senator Stewart, you had mentioned earlier, uh, kind of the, the process. And I, mean, I haven't gone through a civics uh, history class or let alone uh, recall the uh, it's a schoolhouse rock um, <laughs> of ordinary bill on Capitol Hill. That was the last time, and then what, uh, what happens to a bill. So, if you two can at least help me understand and help us understand what's the process and how to get it to the finish line in order for it to. Well, that, that is a very good question, and, and, and of course, it goes back to education. Um, we have a similar, uh, the House has a similar process as the Senate. Uh, we only have 40 members in the Senate, and Representative Escamani has a lot of members, so <laughs> she's got to do a lot of talking. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, we've been assigned three committees that this uh, bill has to be part of. The first one is um, agreed to hear it. And once it goes to that committee, then it goes to another, the second committee, and then the last one before it goes to the floor. So the bills, all bills, not just Yours is a special bill, but not just this bill, but all bills have to go through three committees before it goes to the floor, and it has to go through the committees on the House as well, so we're in tandem with each other. Um, but sometimes, sometimes ours moves a little faster because we don't have as many people that we have to deal with. Um, and it's just a matter of, of getting with the chairman of each committee and, and, and telling them that you really want your bill to be heard and get their agreement to put it on the agenda. So we have that done for the first committee. And uh, once it goes through, uh, then we'll be on our way to the second one. And we'll be doing the same thing. So um, I feel really good in the Senate that, the, uh, from the one side I've talked with, that uh, the chairman of these committees are typically Republican. And I have talked with them, and uh, they seem to be very receptive. Uh, to uh, this bill. So we just have to keep our fingers crossed that everybody in tandem runs their bill uh, and that they, there's no, and I'm glad to hear that you have a Republican that is signed on as co sponsor. That 
She is absolutely correct. It makes a big difference. So we'll continue to work on that and I think that in my in my house, in my Senate, I think we're doing pretty well. We'll do very well. But we still need your help. Yeah. No matter what I say, we still need your help. So I appreciate uh your making sure that everybody coordinates with one another and gets that information out. Um, and Representative, you may have some other tips. Yeah, um, just to add to that, like the Senator said, we have 120 members in the Florida House. And so it's 120 members that got their buy-in compared to 40 in the Senate. So it is a lot more people, which is why everyone's engagement here is really important because as the process of the bill becoming law, as the Senator outlined, is you have the bill, it gets agenda to committees, and they have to shepherd it through every committee. Keep in mind that bills can't change the committee process, so sometimes the chair of that committee and the staff of those committees will offer recommendations, so we engage really closely with the Make Us Visible um, leadership team before those type of suggestions actually come into an amendment if it's necessary. But ideally, both bills stay the same because they have to pass their respective chambers and every member has to, has to vote on it. Now, a bill like this just needs 50% plus one, you'll be a super majority to pass, but of course, with an issue like this, you really want it to be a majority vote or as close to as possible, which is why those individual conversations with lawmakers are so important because even if your lawmaker doesn't serve on one of these committees or isn't a leader in one of these committees, a chair or a vice chair or a ranking member in the case of the House, they will see the, if we do everything right, they will see the bill eventually. So it's still good to have those conversations, ask them to co sponsor it. Um, and also, don't lose hope, right? I will tell you that good bills don't always pass the first year. And obviously, our goal is to get it through. But I'll tell you, the Florida House, there are, you know, I spoke to the chair of the Education Committee uh, two days ago in Tallahassee, and, you know, he's had bills himself that don't pass the first time. So, of course, our goal is this session, which began January 11th. But I also want to encourage all our advocates, you know, government doesn't always move as fast as we want it to. So, we're going to keep trying and keep trying if we don't make it this session. But, of course, our mission is for it to pass and for us to get bipartisan support every step of the way, which is why this first Republican, I, I know, will not be the last. We've already had conversations with other Republicans, um, and so the fact that we finally got a co-sponsor, usually that's, uh, like I said earlier, a catalyst for more follow-up. Great. Just one last question. is regarding the, the uh, input from the community and from citizens. How frequent should that happen, and is it more the volume of uh, you know, constituents to, to provide you know, input? Important. Yeah, it, it is really important, and I, I think that you want to try to get a response. I think that's the biggest thing, right? So, um, first of all, you want to contact your actual elected officials, your city senators, and your house representatives, and talk to their staff, talk to them. I think an email is important. So you can try to call, that, that helps too. And if they are your member, they really should accept a meeting request from you. And it can be a 15 minute meeting, just talk about why this is important to you and then ask them to post sponsor. You always want to have an ask at these meetings, right? If you're trying to communicate with the leaders of these committees, the chairs, um, then the ask is to not always support the bill into agenda of the bill. And again, I, I think any communication is important. You know, I, if you can avoid the template emails, I think that's helpful only because template emails are not the same as, as an original email, right? And then I also would encourage folks to be as uh, succinct as possible because lawmakers are very, very busy. Um, and, I'll, and, and, you know, we read all our emails, but it can be overwhelming if, if it's a, you know, get, like focus on your key points and get to the ask. So the quicker the email is and the quicker the ask is, and the more we can actually have that substantive conversation. All right, thank you. And I want to add to that, um, since I know and I can tell you that it'll be heard in the education committee, I don't care where you live, I want you to write every single member of the education committee and get and tell them how strongly you feel about supporting this bill because they're the ones that's going to vote on it doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter um who your representative is per se but in the senate since we know the education committee i think there's like seven people on that committee maybe more I, i'm not on education but um, write to them anyway, and, and Representative Esquire brings a really good point. I, I have had, um, we call them templates, where one person suggests that you write this and you just cut and paste and you send it off because it's an easy thing to do. 
Well, when you get 500 of them, you know, it hardly seems personal. So it's better to change it around a little bit and make it your own. And uh, so, because what ends up happening when it's a template and it's the same verbiage of every single one you get, um, it tends to be overlooked. And we don't want anybody to be overlooked. We want you to, you know, even if it's a sentence, it doesn't have to be long. Um, but you can just write anything that says you want us to support the bill. So I have that education committee. You can look it up on the web. Uh, we can give it to your leadership and you can get it out. Write the members of that committee. And I think that will go a long way too. Thank you so much for that. And if you look at all the tables on your way out when you're getting your treats, uh, there will be QR codes you can scan, and we will put all of that information up uh, pretty much live while this is happening. So you'll be able to get all that information uh, from us. We try to make it as easy and as accessible as possible. So thank you for that. Next, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Vanessa Colby from the NAACP. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Mimi, for hosting this important event. And thank you also, Representative Estamani and Senator Stewart, for sponsoring these bills. And it really is an honor to be in the presence of so many passionate activists from around the community. So my name is Dr. Vanessa Tulsi, and I'm the first vice president of the NAACP. That stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And I'm also the our Asian and Pacific Islander chair. So the mission of the NAACP is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons. And in really trying to embrace that mission of equality of all persons, we've recently started efforts to try to better stand up for our Asian and Pacific Islander community. So for example, recently we've worked with the Orange County Sheriff's Department to try to advocate that they establish a API liaison. And thank you so much, Siku Mimi Chan, for also helping to advocate for that. And so recently they have established seven API liaisons, so we're very excited about that. And the reason why you know we really try to expand our efforts to to try to advocate for the AAPI community is because there have been things that have been going on for decades. For example, racism against our Amensa community, and so Amensa is Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian community, um, at least from September 11th, if not before then. And also, we all know about racism against our East Asian communities stemming from racist rhetoric around the coronavirus pandemic. And so knowledge is really power. And so thank you so much to Sifu Mimi Chan for advocating for this effort to include AAPI history in uh, our K through 12 Florida curriculum. If perhaps when I was younger, if we had learned about these things and you know, if this was in the curriculum nationwide, then perhaps things like so much racism rampant against AAPI community could be prevented because we could really learn from history. So for me, for example, as somebody who's Trinidadian of Indian descent, so I personally am of South Asian descent, it was disappointing when I was in school when I was younger and you know I didn't learn about things like you know uh, birthright citizenship stemming from struggles at the Supreme Court level around the Chinese Exclusion Act or about apartheid in Palestine, or even about Japanese internment camps in the actual United States. These are all things that I never learned about until I was a grown adult. And so I feel like that's important to learn about these things as we're in school and perhaps try to normalize, you know, knowing about other cultures and things like that, because AAPI history and AAPI culture is American history and is American culture. And so um, thank you so much again, Mimi, for advocating for HB 281 and SB 490. And I do have a couple questions. My first question is for Representative Eskamani. And so when I was younger, you know, as somebody of South Asian descent, I got bullied, sometimes using the word terrorist, things like that. And there are some children in the audience who I've seen on the Sifu Mimi Cham show sharing their stories about how in the current school semester, they're getting bullied, you know, of surrounding the coronavirus pandemic with racist, you know, racist rhetoric against them for being East, of East Asian descent. And so to children like that, like children like us, what kind of advice would you give them? Let's say they 
you know, because we feel kind of helpless in that situation. I used to feel helpless. So what kind of advice would you give them? What can they be doing? Can they do anything as a child to help girls like these? And perhaps what can their parents do to try and help push for girls like these? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the, the awesome introduction and the question, too. And I can totally relate because growing up in Orange County as well, a lot of cases, I was the only Iranian kid in a classroom setting. And I remember my first experience with racism was right after 9 11 uh, when folks asked if my classmates asked me if I was a, related to Osama bin Laden, because some of the stereotypes. And I always felt different just to begin with because of the color of my hair, my skin. And, your audience are also very hairy people, so you always feel like you don't fit in to some of these spaces, right? Because the definition of beauty is, is historically in this country is not what I look like, right? So you, you try to find ways to fit in and to maintain your authentic self, but it can get really difficult when folks are pushing you into these boxes, right? Um, so for the young people in this space, my biggest piece of advice is to be yourself. You are beautiful, you are valued, you are deserving. Um, for kids who say those type of things to you, a lot of times it's, it's grounded in, in, in disinformation. And to be brave in those moments to not only ask for help, but depending on the scenario, if, if you do feel like this is a classmate you can actually talk to and, and ask them, why would you say that? Why do you feel that way? You know, I'm a firm believer in, in open-ended questions leading with wonder and trying to figure out why is that child being a bully? Because chances are it's trauma they have from something else, right? And it's misinformation in their home environment, which brings me to uh, the, the comfort to not only know what it's saying to you is not something you deserve, but to also seek that help by talking to a parent, talk to a trusted adult. You're not alone. And I always felt very alone in those circumstances. And Thank goodness I have a twin sister, so she's always like my empathy partner. Your siblings kind of, you know, are those folks in your life. You have them, you're lucky enough to have them, they support you in those moments. But um, find those those trust people, right? Because when you have that moment, you shouldn't be alone. For parents in this space, so first of all, I think it's talking to your kids about it, right? I, we all like to think that, uh, I, you know, school is a safe space and judgment free, but obviously that's not true. So. Being able to actually check in with your kid and say, hey, how was school today? What happened today? You know, did, did anyone say anything to you that was mean? Like, you know, try to take the elevator down with them because some of our, some of our kids might internalize that and just assume that I deserve that rhetoric or um, that's a normal day for me. Help them realize that's not normal, right? And then take action from that. And even more actively, if, 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 if those type of experiences have not occurred in a school setting, uh, still talk to the educators. Talk to your teachers, talk to your principal, make sure they realize the strength of the AAPI community and that your experiences are valued. And um, we had so many cultural events um, growing up in Orange County schools. And I do remember bringing Persian food, you know, to my classmates and it smelled so different compared to other food, right? And, and it was a learning opportunity for my classmates to also get a part of my cultural experience and, and learn to love it instead of be afraid of it. And I think that there's also opportunities in a classroom stand like we're doing with this bill, but is to teach people about our culture versus have it be an unknown that then can be exploited to cause harm. Well, thank you so much, Representative Eskamani, for that uh, for that thorough explanation. And I have another question for Senator Stewart. And so as the NAACP, we're a nonpartisan organization, and so NAACP Orange County is very proud to support this nonpartisan bill. And in trying to build bipartisan support, what are some things that you find to be the most efficacious? So is it emails, is it calls, the social media tagging them more? What are some what are some things that kind of work? Well, they all work if you um, have enough people um, requesting the support of the bill. So any kind of avenue that you can use, whether it's on social media. I thought you did a really good job uh, promoting even this event. Um, I saw it several places on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I, think, I think there's a lot of young people here too that know how to work the system better than maybe some others, but um, I've learned a lot even though I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> You have to learn how to use the system to your advantage. Um, so, you know, like I said before, emails are great, 
Social media is wonderful. Um, you know, you could go and I go on TikTok and try to make it. I have fun <laughs> to support it because that's like the big thing. And um, so I think any kind of outreach is going to be beneficial. Okay, well, thank you so much, Senator Stewart. All right, thank you for that. And by the way, she is very, very up to date. I am not even on TikTok, so kudos <laughs> to you, Senator. Well, I don't dance. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. And she is. She's on Instagram. I see her posting. So that, that's incredible. Um, I'd like to turn it out over now to Paolo Dittani of Asia Trends. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Mayor of the Wolf, for having me today. Thank you, Representative Sonali Senator Stewart, for being here as well. Um, so I'm with uh, Asia Trends, who are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we were founded in 2005 um, after Gary Lau and Charlotte Bond, who are here today. Uh, so no acronym, Asia Trends, nice and simple, right? <laughs> um, so we are uh, actually celebrated 15 years last year, so please, thank you. <laughs> um, and so we're the first media uh, publication of our type in Florida to be very specific to Asian American culture and society. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been with Asia Trends for seven years, so it's been very heartwarming seeing our community grow over the years, networking with other communities, cultural events, everything. Probably not a lot of you here today, just a lot of our events, right? Um, and so it's really important that we have this representation. You know, we represent ourselves as Asia Trends, but also in the mainstream as well, right? And you know, it's after the uh, Atlanta shooting earlier this year, you know, Asia Trend, we put out a statement, you know, vowing for our Central Florida community to be better advocates for you know more Asian inclusivity in the education system. Um, and that's just meant what you know one of many action items. And so we're really honored to be uh, assisting and you know advocating for this bill. And we thank you both as well for being part of that. Because it really is important. And you know, Sifu Mini, she's an educator herself. And you know, she has like this quote she says, one of the best ways to make a long term change is through education. And so we consider it a great privilege to be on this as well. So I also have a couple questions as well. And my first question will be to Representative Kamani. Um, so, just in any sense, not just you know, both of us, you know, Middle Eastern descent and West Asia represent. <laughs> um, it's, you know, you spoke at a conference for the Asian American Student Union some years ago at UCF, and you spoke about your um, high school government teacher, the also my high school government teacher, Mr. Yeah. Morris, and how he encouraged you to really pursue civic engagement. So I was wondering if you could speak more to the importance of inspiration in the classroom translating to leadership development. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And shout out to our University High School grads. I know there's a lot of us in the space, so go, go Cougars. Uh, you and Judge just down the road from here, and I did grow, grow up in East Orlando, so um, it's, it's, it's always great to be home. Um, it makes such a difference. It truly does. So Mr. Morris uh, was our AP government teacher, um, and he was like a, you know, a pretty average Joe, if you will. and. Brought into the classroom, the stories of immigrants, the stories of our farm workers, the stories of folks um, who served as allies to help others get the right to vote, who were, who were being disenfranchised. And so he really demonstrated that each one of us have power in the process, but we also have to practice that power and build that power. And I think that's such an important reminder for all of our diverse community members um, to, it's a reinforcement once more that your everyday struggles are not isolated. Chances are when you get around the dinner table and talk about your day to your peers, a struggle you had or an experience that you had is similar to someone else's. That's how so many social movements begin, is that it's an opportunity where folks come together, share their lived experiences and realize, oh my God, I had that same experience at the grocery store. Or I also didn't get that promotion that I asked for. Or I, I am being treated differently when I'm trying to get a home compared to my white peers. You know, it's those moments where folks realize that, that our struggles are tied together and no one is truly free until we're all free. And I think in the classroom for me, that was my that was my manifesto, right? Like being in that space with Mr. Norris helped me realize as a daughter of immigrants that I have a role to play. I should get registered to vote. I need to go to Tallahassee and understand state government better. And eventually I would 
will run for office. And that is not something I, I ever thought I would do. I grew up in a working class family. My parents struggled every single day. My, my mom worked at Kmart. My dad had two jobs. And my mom passed away when I was 13 years old. And so, you know, the cards are very much stacked against us in my family. Um, but it was those, those moments in the classroom. And education is so powerful because no matter how much money you make or the languages you speak or whoever you worship, the color of your skin, the classroom is a space where we are all equal. It's supposed to be a space where we're all equal, right? I think what our bill does is it, is, it, is it furthers us towards that goal of saying that if you identify as API, we're also going to talk about your history in, in, in America, your history in Florida. And that is going to be a transformational moment, not just for kids who identify as API, but for their peers. Because in Florida, there are going to be classrooms where there is no API student. Right? I mean, that's reality. Florida is a diverse state, but we have parts, in, especially in rural parts of Florida, where this is going to be a, a, an empowering moment for kids who maybe don't have Asian friends yet to start thinking about Asian folks as their friends. And I think that alone is very, very, very powerful. And so it motivates me to also uh, file this bill. Thank you so much for that, for the money and uh, sharing your story. That's always very motivational uh, on time. Next question is for Senator Stewart. Um, so big shout out to your legislative aide, Dustin. It was very easy reaching out to your office about this bill. Like, it was super easy, like surprisingly <laughs> easy. So uh, mad props uh, to him for that. And uh, my biggest thanks. And so you've been in a uh, government position for quite some time in Central Florida. I'm sure you've seen the community grow in you know, several regards. You know, we have our most defeated trips, our most like on area. It's growing and it continues to grow in you know, Florida. And the Central Florida, especially, is growing like never before. I'm sure we've all noticed by the growing food scene here. Right? Yes. <laughs> That's a good indicator, always. Yes. So, my question to you, Senator Stewart, is from a governmental perspective, uh, what is the tangible benefit to having a diverse community? Well, you know, we've got, I wish there was just something that just said cultural studies <laughs> and they included all cultures that we didn't. Have to go and have an African American this and a you know Hispanic that and all that, but it seems like the point where we are right now, we're having to uh, uh, go individually. And you know, eventually, I'd like to see that we have plain cultural studies within the public school system, so that everybody that feels left out can feel they're in. And I think that the only way to do that is to work with government. To provide that needs for which uh, we're trying to do with the, the bills today to get um, our community better educated on uh, where they just they just simply don't know. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, without these bills, they may never know. So uh, it's important that we do full, fully understand that bills of life, such as what we have. For us to review of the Tallahassee is so important to get to that level that everybody would like to be at. So I've been in government for a very long time. We're always finding out new things that we should be addressing. When we hear it, we do something about it. Well, you're a good representative. <laughs> so, you know, I, I want to be a good representative. So when we hear things, we take action. And this is an action. That we absolutely have to do. Well, thank you for that response. Um, just, just a quick follow up. When you say being a good representative or just good leadership in general, um, you know, it's leadership is almost like a two way tax between the community, the people you serve, and, you know, and the leadership. Uh, what has, you know, what's the most impactful thing you feel you've learned from your constituents? Are you going to use me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, what have I learned from my constituents? You know, they are not shy about reaching out to my office, and we are not shy about responding to them. Um, also, here in the room uh, is one of my aides, Travis Flynn. Um, and you know, you can call my office for any, even if it sounds like a minute little issue, and we will try our best to solve those problems. Uh, but it's really the community that drives what I do. And I'm sure that is the same with uh, Representative Esteban. You are the ones who help us do a good job.
job in Tallahassee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Ken Lee Wong and Natasha Ong from Boala. Yay, Um, speaking of large acronyms, go, go on, right? That, that stands for the Greater Orlando Asian American Bar Association, uh, go on for short. Um, and, and one of our chief missions uh, as an organization is obviously uh, advocate for the interests of Asian American API uh, attorneys practicing in Central Florida, but more importantly, perhaps, to advocate for the interests of the AAPI community at large. Um, and so to that end, uh, GoAB is extremely proud to support uh, this bill and, and the worthy cause it represents. Um, and, and on a personal level, too, I, I think I share the same sentiment that's been expressed on this panel today, and perhaps by many of you in this room, that there are uh, perhaps significant gaps in our education um, that, when filled, would possibly lead to a more meaningful dialogue in our classrooms and create a better society and environment for our kids to learn and thrive. So that's that's something that's very important to me on a personal level and also uh, the interest of the law at large. Um, my, my question is for uh, Representative Eskimani. Um, this campaign has been uh, a lot of things, but chief among them is uh, seeing individuals who are previously unengaged in civic involvement and engagement um, being very motivated to support this bill or otherwise learning about the legislative process. How would you suggest that we continue this this momentum? Ooh, I love this question. And I'm just like nodding up because everything you're saying is so powerful. And I would regret it if I didn't encourage everyone in this space to consider running for office one day, especially our young leaders. Um, I'm the first Iranian American elected in any public office in Florida. I will not be the last. And I've had many friends who identify as API, most run for office, Henry Lim, actually went to the same seat, he didn't win the primary back in, I guess, 2016, but he ran for office locally. Um, one of my friends, Kevin Cho Timpton, just declared in a South Florida race. Uh, and so we gotta get some more API voices into office. And so for all our young people who are, who are getting more interested in politics, uh, this world is yours. And uh, you might not see yourself in office yet, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. And so part of the other ways to continue engagement uh, I don't know if Ricky Lee is here. I want to give a shout out to Ricky Lee, Casey Chomps food blogger. But Ricky is one of my very good friends from UCF. He was an organizer at UCF with the API community, doing voter registration, uh, making sure members of the community are plugged in uh, to what candidates are saying and doing. And of course, uh, around and around issues happening at every level of government. So this is a really exciting piece of legislation but chances are there's other, other issues you also care about, right? It might be affordable housing, it might be the environment, it might be animal rights, it might be um, immigration reform. There's going to be so many other issues that you care about. What you're learning as the process for this policy is applied to any policy. And so I really encourage leaders and, and individuals in the API community and every community to also think about what other issues impact your daily life. and. And how can you use these new skills that you're learning to move this bill forward, to move other issues forward, or to stop issues you don't like from moving forward? Because again, all, all of this is intersectional, right? Like we're here talking about um, the education of the API contributions, but at the end of the day, there's also going to be economic disparities among the API community we need to address. There's going to be a lack of affordable housing. There's going to be the need for increased access to health care for the API community, especially as, as we get more diverse, we need more language competency. You know, so during this pandemic, our office, we hosted um, uh, several vaccine events, and one of them was focused on uh, working with our Vietnamese and Korean community locally. And we hosted at the local Vietnamese church over the College Park area. And our goal at that event was to have on-site translators who could speak Vietnamese, because we know for so many of our API elders, they do not speak English, but they should still get the vaccine, and we have to make sure they have access to the vaccine. So, you know, we're centering on this educational piece of policy, but let's not forget that there are so many other disparities that exist that we can also use policy to address and to accomplish. Thank you so much, and that's very well said regarding access. I, I think that's the issue that, that we, we have to address as a community. 
My husband? Yes. Thank you very much for being here today and for sponsoring the bill. My question on um, feedbacks uh, of the Ken Williams question. Um, first off, hi everyone, my name is Ron Chanto Liam. Um, Ken Williams, the, the president of Goala. I know he did share that, but I'm an immediate past president, so I want to give him kudos for that. <laughs> So um, I will say that thank you so much for sponsoring this, because I do recall when my father um, came here from Cambodia as a refugee, he always spoke to me and shared to me that it's so important to have an education. In Cambodia, he only had a equivalent of a second grade education. After that, he would work in a poor farm and take care of his family. So when he had the opportunity to come here to America and also give that opportunity to his family, he shared with us, come for education, will open up doors for you. What we experienced in Cambodia limited us, but here in America, we have the potential to do so much more with our education. And I'll add to that by saying that by having AAPI representation opens up so many other doors as well, because not only are you seeing education value, but also inspiring young people to pursue other paths, to know that there's so much history that's been erased and not discussed, but now we're shining a light to say that there it's been done before and it won't be done again. So I just want to say thank you so much, you two, for, for coming out and um, supporting us and being your peer amazing and your team amazing. So thank you so much for um, just bearing this torch for us and, and leading the, the path with your eternal blazer in your own right. My question um, for you, Senator, is the last in 2020, we noticed that there was a huge increase of AAPI voter turnout. Now, that stems from a lot of different things, and I'll speak from a local level. Um, we have key organizations from local community levels, and I know Anna, you were part of it too, for Healy. I think a lot of people here in this room, Shally, everyone came together, not go out, everyone came together to make it happen. Now, that was a huge grassroots effort which really took a lot of manpower. Now, the numbers show that there was a huge turnout from every demographic, age, geography, gender. What's amazing is that it's not just locally, it was nationwide. What would you say to the community to help continue this momentum? Because we don't want to see it stop. We want to see it grow. How can we continue this momentum and not only that, build more trust and confidence in the voter base. Well, thank you for turning out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of us that have a lot to be thankful for because you did. Um, and to keep it is hard to keep that momentum going, but also, and I know Representative Escobani and myself, we've been really working hard on voter registration because we need more people to become involved in the political process. So it's not just turnout as much as it is finding others who will uh, register to vote so that we can count on their votes uh, when the time comes for 2022 is coming up. Now there's redistricting going on and I'm sure you've read about it. Some good, some bad some really bad, um, and once that gets settled out, uh, you'll know uh, what district uh, will be representing you, and you need to make sure that uh, no matter what happens, the voter registration takes place so that you have that voice and clout to get the person you think is best represented to represent you gets elected, and that's all sort of the process is we really need to do that. And, uh, you know, you, you can do it, I mean, you don't have to have, you don't have to select a party to be able to be effective, but you should uh, go out and vote. And you can't, and some people are going to have to vote like they voted in 2018, but they're going to need to get more people to vote because that's where your crowd magnifies. And that's when I think that uh, we should be working right now on voter registration. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panel, uh, especially Senator Stewart and Representative Eskamani, who is running out to another meeting right now. So let's see our for our Florida Program Director Adrian Lee. Hi, all. It's so nice to see all of y'all here.
our state representatives for joining us for that community leadership panel. Um, I'm really excited to be introducing y'all to our next guest at today's event. Dr. Jason Oliver Chang is an associate professor for Asian and Asian American Studies over at the University of Connecticut. Um, he is also the director for that institute as well. And in Connecticut, their team was able to achieve passing the law. We're really excited that he's going to be joining and sharing some words uh, for our team today. All right. Hi there, everyone. Can you hear me? Sorry, that's me. I need and uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Can can you hear me? Mm. Are, are you guys ready? While we are having technical difficulties, I will say our food has arrived. So if you're interested, there is fried rice from the hawker, CD salads from today, New Asian and sushi. And uh, New Star Wealth has donated a bunch of cookies and treats, and there's water. So feel free to grab it and come back to your spot. Uh, we are going to get Dr. Chang with you in one moment. So sorry, Dr. Chang. We were having technical difficulties, but we can see you now. So I'll just, um, you know what we can do if you're comfortable, just go ahead and grab your box and then have a seat. There's boxes outside as well. There should be a whole table outside of exactly the same thing. So there's a table um, on each patio. Uh, thank you all. And we'll be with you in a few seconds. All right. So just a reminder, there's a table um, on each patio as well. So if it starts to get crowded here, they're just around the corner outside. There's exactly the same boxes. So you can just grab that and have a seat. Thank you. Yeah, we are, we are continuing on with our program. We have Dr. Jason Che. We have our legislative, um, we have our uh, Dr. Christian Rebello coming up shortly. So please uh, don't leave. This is not me. All right, if everyone can have a seat, we're going to turn over the mic now to Dr. Jason Chang. Make Us Visible Florida is also part of Make Us Visible National, and it is a nationwide coalition that is rooted to our preventive coalition to the anti-Asian hate crimes that we've been seeing. So uh, as Adrian mentioned, that Make Us Visible uh, national team, Dr. Jason Chang will be joining us, and he's going to speak on behalf of Make Us Visible. So, um, if we could just please have a seat because we still have speakers going uh, and we can respect their time. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go on with the show. Okay. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Are you okay? Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, should I try it? Yes, go for it. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and also, thank you for all of your hard work. This movement is about you and your communities. So we started in Connecticut uh, by you know, this, an initiative to build resources, to support teachers, and to activate our communities. And we successfully passed a K through eight model curriculum and have since then expanded to Georgia, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and also with, with y'all in Florida. It was so exciting with a few additional states in the works now. It's been really inspiring to see this become a national movement, and we're so lucky to have Florida join us. In fact, all eyes are on Florida as you have the opportunity to make history in a really big way. Big movements start with individual people, and that happens in Florida. What, what happens in Florida will reverberate across the US. As a community, let's work together to make sure Asian American Pacific Islanders aren't excluded anymore. Let our voices and our stories be heard. Our work in Connecticut has paved the way for other states to find their path. And since passing our legislation, we have worked with teacher education programs, social studies coordinators, individual students, student groups, and parents, along with our state's Humanities Foundation, Historical Society, local libraries and arts organizations. These partners uh, are crucial to supporting the creation and implementation of the State Department of Education's model curriculum. So we know y'all are up for the challenge because we've heard your stories and we've seen your commitment and energy. So another advantage that you possess is having Dr. Christian Ravella uh, on your Make Us Visible Florida team. It's my honor to now introduce him. He's an assistant professor of philosophy and American studies at the University of Central Florida, published scholar, committed educator, and public advocate for the Asian American community. It's always wonderful to see you. Please welcome Professor Ravella. I thought I was going to do a lecture, but I think it's more better just to talk about what does it say to visit the other. So, uh, okay. so uh, why are we in this room today? There's some obvious reasons. Uh, we are here to support the process HB 281 and HB But for me, the answer comes in the form of another question. The question that arises when I talk to some of my Asian Americans. Why did it take so long to learn this history? This is a question all too familiar to me. I too have asked it and felt the kind of alienation that underlies that question. The irony in my case, however, is that I grew up in Southern California, one of the epicenters of Asian American history and surrounded by many Asian Americans. If there was a place where such history would be taught, it would be there. And yet, I never learned anything substantive about Asian American history in my history classes from my K 12 education. At best, there's a kind of passing reference to Chinese laborers and the Chinese Communist Railroad, or Japanese internment during World War II, but nothing beyond that. And reflecting upon like, my ideal condition, I can only imagine what it's like for Asian Americans. My introduction to Asian American history came accidentally in an Asian American literature course in college. There, I read books like John and Robin's No No Boy and learned not only about the kind of loyalty questionnaires about how surrounding the internment camps, but the fallout for those who spurned it. Such reading and many others in the class served as my gateway into more serious study of Asian American history graduate school. Indeed, it was there that I read Carlos Bulaton's semi autobiographical novel. America is the heart. And that I learned about the Manong generation, the first generation of Filipino immigrants to the United States in the early 20th century. They worked as migrant laborers, harvesting agricultural fields in California, packing salmon in the fishing canneries of Alaska, and serving as the cooks, waiters, and bellhops, and other jobs in the service industry of San Francisco. Though their lives were hard, it did not define them. 
like others, they build community, they have complex lives, they love, they messed up, they dare. But learning about this history is about more than about myself or my fellow Asian Americans. It has been a tough way to connect myself to the history of others. Indeed, the Manam was central to the farm workers of California in the middle of the Northwest Western. Figures like Larry Long, Philip Vera Cruz, organized Filipino farm workers. They, along with others in the agricultural workers organizing them, or AWAR, initiated the famous Delano Brakes Strike in 1965. Yet they knew that success was only possible with solidarity with all farm workers. So they reached out to Mexican American farm worker organizer Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta for their, for their help to organize Filipino. Filipino American, Mexican American farm workers, which eventually led to the formation of the United Farm Workers Union. Together, after five years of marches, boycotts, and other forms of nonviolent resistance, they won collective bargaining rights for over 10,000 farm workers. That's just one example. Our intersecting histories can also be found in Brown v. Board of Education. Such a monumental civil rights case of school desegregation was built on the legal precedent of Mexican Americans in the 1947 case, and as we've and by the Chinese Americans in the 1885 California Supreme Court case, State v. Berlin. In both of these pre Brown cases, we find families fighting mightily to improve the lives of their children through education. And if you get a sense of that ferocity in an 1885 letter, that Mary Tate wrote to the San Francisco Board of Education in response to the outcome of the California Supreme Court case. So you see, she actually won that case, proving that all children were entitled to a public education in California. But instead of allowing her daughter, Marnie, to attend her local school, the school board chose to build a kind of substandard school farther away that would be Chinese only. As you can imagine, she was raged. Like, in Mary's letter, she writes the following quote, I see that they're going to make all sorts of excuses to keep my child out of public school. Dear sirs, will you please tell me, is it a disgrace to be born Chinese? Did God make us all? What right have you to bar my children out of the school? Because she is of Chinese descent. There's no other worldly reason that you can keep her out. End quote. Of course, we find the same kind of courage for finding equal, equal educational opportunities from later generations of Asian Americans, such as in the 1974 case, uh, Supreme Court case, Wild B. Nichols, which made bilingual education a right, though initiated by a kind of Chinese American plaintiff, its legacy has helped all multilingual children succeed at school. Ultimately, what these moments and many others that I can talk about show is a kind of recognition that Asian American history is American history. To learn such history is to understand what self and, and others membership and participation in American democracy. Yet perhaps more pressingly at stake in this educational campaign is the desire for safety in our communities here in Florida and elsewhere across the United States. According to the latest report by Stop AAPI Hate from March 19, 2020 to September 30th, 2021, a total of 10,378 incidents of Asian Americans and Pacific Islander persons were reported to them. Of the reported incidences, the majority occurred this year. Verbal harassment and shutting make up most of these incidents, but a staggering 16.1, meaning 1,600 for our physical thoughts. The statistics of these trends are incredibly disturbing. Again, from the report, one in five Asian Americans have experienced some sort of hate in the past five years. One in three Asian American parents have stated that their child has experienced a hate incident in school the past year. Even though the epicenter of these incidents are in California and New York, uh, Florida is actually the eighth highest in the United States. Indeed, 
When we, are, when we held our virtual student town hall event on September 23rd, we heard stories from Asian American kids as young as eight years old, receiving abusive comments from their peers by, quote, Chinese people need to go back to their country, they are dirty, they have viruses, or are you going to eat a dog? Incidents like these in wars create a pervasive climate of hostility and kind of fear for our communities that nobody deserves. That is why HD2A1 and SB490 are so important. Education is the only long term solution to combating the kind of racism and xenophobia that underlies the incidents of anti Asian harassment and violence. So, um, Thank you everyone for listening to me. I'm, I'm going to close with some literature because I'm a Indiana, I'm a Asian American literature scholar, and so I didn't give you some. I think my my degree would be remote. <laughs> so, uh, so here it goes. Okay. So for me, at least, the desire for belonging and this felt sense of recognition found in learning about Asian American history is best expressed in Chen Wei Li's novel Native Speaker. It is a complex novel. An immigrant narrative that draws on elements of a spy and domestic fiction to weave its story of Korean American protagonist Henry Park. At its thematic center, the novel explores how language and speech are connected to Asian American belonging. It raises questions like what does it mean to be a native speaker? What is the relation between how one looks, how it sounds, how one and one's identity? How does accent and pronunciation mark one's belonging? And ultimately, can there be more than one way to be a native speaker? Of course, like all great literature, the answer to that final question is never fully settled by the novel. Its ending beautifully shows us the desire for belonging implied by such questions, which I believe is the driving spirit of our campaign for HB 281 SB 490. The novel closes with a scene of education. Henry and his now reconciled wife, Leela, are wrapping up an English language lesson to an ethnically diverse group of kids. The English lesson, however, was never really about proper speech, but instead a lesson that teaches, quote, that there is nothing to fear. Lilo wants to offer up herself, forcing with language to show the students it's by the methodology, end quote. Here, the forcing with language is not error, not bad speech, and not the mark of rights of their service. It is the play involved in the way language connects us all. It is precisely this sense of connection that closes the novel that I'd like to close with us now. So here's, here's, here's a more to bring it. Quote, Lila gives each one a sticker. She uses the class list to write their names and send the sun first badges. Everybody, she says, has been a good citizen. She will say the name quickly, write on the sticker, and then have me press it on each of their chests as they leave. It is a line of quiet faces. I take them down in my head. Now she calls them each one as best as she can, taking care of every last pitch and accent. And I hear her speaking a dozen lovely and native languages, calling all the difficult things who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Now I'd like to introduce speaker story. We have a handful of people who are going to be sharing with us. And as Paula mentioned earlier, that is something that is super important that connects us to our history, that connects our history and our stories together. And it makes learning all the more interesting and fascinating. So really excited. Our volunteer coordinator is going to be here to introduce this awesome panel. We'll have one speaker at a time. So please give them your attention and love. They are not Professional speakers, they're not legislators, so they need a warm welcome, all right? Sandra. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Dr. Ravella. It was awe inspiring, and I, I, everything you said was just resonating. Thank you so much for being here today. I was standing on the left there, and I scanned the room, and I was admiring how diverse this room was. It's amazing that this is Central Florida. How we, on a Saturday, have attracted all of you. And if you scan the room, you can see that we have representation and the cohesiveness that is in this room that will resonate and help this cause. And not only is it a worthy cause, but you're elevating 
the community. You're inspiring the youth. And if we really dig deep, we can see that there are no differences. There are more similarities that we have with all of our ethnic groups than differences. Whether you are Caucasian, Latino, African American, Asian American, we are here for a worthy cause. And today we have so many interesting stories that will tie it all together and help us understand what is our role? What is our role today, 2021, as we embark on 2022? Let's give a round of applause for Charles Lewis. How are you guys doing? I would like to give a short poetry based on my experience. I'm the lord of a thousand years where shed a thousand tears. Stuck between two labels, it's hard to be a person. Especially while I'm still with my same big ally to shed ourselves from the identity button. Born in Brooklyn, I eventually went to China for a joyful life with my extended family as a youngster. Ultimately, I had to leave the warm embrace to reunite with my parents after they got their journey. I was fortunate to bring my maternal grandparents with me to help me retain my ancestry. Even though I grew up in the States and returned to China from time to time for vacation, I always reflect on who my life and intended friends grew up with frenemies in chase of the American fantasy. Living in both worlds, I see the importance of collectivism and acknowledging individual health for innovation and stability. This greatly reflects on my character of action and modesty. As a lover of history, I can consistently think of my ancestors' ambition to escape the old cultural revolution while my generation are trying to survive a new form of persecution. To overcome my past shame in chains of fame and assimilation, I support my family by remembering our legacy and recognizing the hypocrisy in today's incomplete American story. To thrive today, I see it essential to merge my data stories with the newborn AAPI community I'm proud to be a part of as our young community goes. I hope to restore the last link between the motherland and the diaspora. That I'm truly fond of. For the development of AAPI since our schools, I envision this movement to empower our youth to remember no culture is inferior nor superior, as all it takes to start making a better community is not God, but creating that first authentic cultural connection. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, a student, Gavin T. Mark Stein. He is 16, Julian Alexander Wang. He has uh, a piece of work that he wrote up in March, and the title is I Am American. Testing, testing this work. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is uh, Julian Alexander. I have a uh, short article that I recently wrote and was actually published by a school newspaper called I Am American. As a fourth generation American of Asian descent, I find it preposterous that I have to justify how American I am. With the insurgence of Asian hate crimes across the nation, which started with the pandemic, to the atrocious shootings in Atlanta, the reported attacks are close to 3,000 incidents. As much as I don't feel the flight, I am undeniably forced to hear the rhetoric of my people. As many in the Asian and AEPI, Asian American, and Pacific Islander community now live disrupted in fear, doubt, and anger, the stigma of being foreign is painfully real. Racism has and always will be a systematic problem in our society. The demeanor and actions of many politicians has certainly exacerbated the violent behaviors and augmented the fuel the hate. But the divine is deeper than that. The wounds are silent, but they are still raw. The hurt has never healed from the days of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese Massacre of 1871, and the Japanese internment camps. 
Hashtag stop Asian hate. Hashtag not your model minority. Hashtag Asian lives matter. Hashtag don't marginalize us. These hashtags are trending, but honestly, they are words without a backbone. For too long, racism against Asian Americans have been minimized and ignored. The invisibility and inability to proactively raise, raise awareness have resulted in today's powerless struggle. How is it that America, the sophisticated leader of the free world, tolerates such barbarism and inhumanity? I truly believe that humans are not born with sharpened skills to judge and hate. This is a learned habit with encouraged repetition. The hate is then passed down through the generations from innocence to vitriol. In my opinion, the underlying culprit is simply awareness and exposure. Raising awareness is not just muttering words, marching protests, or posting to social media. To navigate proper awareness, the dialogue and training must start at home base. Home is where core values are taught, strong family ideals perpetuate and nurture the importance of respect and understanding of inclusivity. People often fear differences and won't rise to the occasion to explore and learn. But if they are curious enough to probe, there are always more similarities than there are differences. As a young adult, I shouldn't have to worry about my safety. Living the American dream and being a fabric of the melting pot, I should not have to defend why I look different, why I eat certain foods, why I can speak English without an accent, why I am not the model minority, and lastly, why I deserve to belong. The three generations preceding me have molded me into an upstanding and unique individual. I don't have to be as American as apple pie. And as a matter of fact, my discerning tastes prefer Maine while blueberry pie. And without a doubt, I proudly say, I am American. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne Alexander. How do we like the youth of our community coming out, standing as advocates? We need to build our community forward. Next up is Brendan Pearson Wang. He is 17 years old. Hey guys. Uh, so really quick. They are all smart, obedient, and hardworking. Does that ring a bell for anyone in this room? I know for me, it, it certainly does. But you have to think, what's the problem with this controversy if this imagery paints a near-perfect outline of a successful group of people? In our society, these are often admired traits and character benchmarks that exemplify true success, no matter which corner of the earth you come from. But this acknowledgement of merit is a description of what we call a model minority. This model minority concept is one that profiles a specific demographic based primarily on race and ethnicity. And the success of this minority group is ostensibly measured by high level of education attainment and perceived work ethics. These perceived ideals depict how other minority groups should emulate in order to achieve similar results and success. Now, since the 1960s, Asian Americans have been the revered minority group that have received unsolicited accolades of achieving financial success and maintaining a strong family unit. The media promoted this glorious model minority theory through numerous scholarly articles. However, the most notable thesis was written by American sociologist William Peterson. He said he famously coined the model minority concept and conjured up an uncanny notion that specifically amplifies how and why American, Japanese Americans persevere in societies. He wrote that the robust ethics, hard work, and defined culture echoed superior and had admirable standards. Throughout his eight page thesis, he praised how this, these Japanese Americans rose above prejudices and gained enormous successes despite facing huge injustices. He even went as far as to say that blacks and Latinos were the problem minority, lacking in these character traits. 
Peter Smith firmly stated that by any criterion of good citizenship that we choose, the Japanese Americans are better than any other group in our society, including native-born whites. But we all know that the truth is not all Asian Americans are wealthy, mentally stable, or privileged. The unspoken struggles are real. Even in 2020, unemployment rates for Asian Americans remain low compared to other households of color nationwide, with only 3% of unemployed against a national average of 4%. In fact, despite higher education and financial achievements, the Asian American community creates the largest wealth divide in the United States. Again, the myth of a law-abiding, hard-working, submissive people derailed the visibility and need of government help and intervention that other minority groups benefit heavily from. These unusually high marks associated with the American, Asian American stereotype truly portray a, full, a false false positive. Being put on a pedestal for the last 40 years not only scars but continually dismisses and sets this minority group on an awkward and downward spiral. In truth, America is the world's biggest superpower and is unstoppable in setting a tone and narrative for other nations to follow. Now is the time to raise awareness and dispel this old myth. The rhetoric promoting the model minority must change because it's unproductive and deceiving to generalize by racial groups. People need to be recognized for their individual success stories and moral integrity because after all, America unequivocally stands for one nation with one people under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next up, we have Vincent Chu. All right. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Go uh, close, Scott. That's a that, those two are that's a tough act to follow. Up, but let's start with this. Love a man. I did some shoe. Love a man, who my love man I do so see. Love a mama I no bum, jump up. Love a papa I call me. I need to jump up. Call me, baby. Can I call me? Call me. Call me, call me, call me. So to, to translate, <laughs> my name is Vincent Chu. My name is also Chu Song Ji. My mother grew up in Hong Kong. My father is Chinese and grew up and was born and raised in Burma. I was born and raised in America. I'm an American. I'm also Chinese. I'm also Burmese. Sorry, I'm a little emotional because it took a long time for me to say that and to feel that. You see, as a kid, I grew up when my parents were immigrants, and so many have we heard. And I grew up navigating those two worlds. You know, ashamed of my lunch, ashamed of my clothes. I hated, I hated the question, hey, can you say something in Chinese? Which is why I forced myself to do that. You know, and I, and growing up, I got bullied, and, um, and my response to that was to lean in to try to be American. So for me, what I thought was that I would go to school and live my American world and live my American life. And I come home, and be Chinese with my, with my family. And I would live these two worlds in most of my life. You know, at 42 years old, I'm a judge, and it's hard for me to say this. You know, and I, I spent college doing that, trying to be more American. And, and to me, that meant to be more American was to like play football, was to lift weights, you know, was playing a rock band. You know, and I, I went into my legal career. You know, because yeah, I got bullied and I hated bullies, so I became a, I became a prosecutor and then I became, I, I became a, an attorney with the United States government. And it still very much felt like 
And I, I got married to a wonderful woman, I had three kids, and it still very much felt like I had my American world. And then I'd go visit my parents and go back to my Chinese world. And when I became a judge, I started two things happening. First, I started spending every day with people in the community, um, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Indian, Haitian, Vietnamese, all of them part of our community, all of them part of our little piece of America here. And the second thing that happened is that I saw how much it meant um, to the AAPI community, that I had become a judge. I was the first Chinese judge, um, I don't know, I think ever, in, around here, maybe in Florida. But, um, and because of those two things, it made me realize that I'm not navigating two worlds, that none of us are. I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You know, we all are just navigating our world. And the realization for me was that it's not, you know, I was trying so hard to become American, to become something that that I already was innately. And to be both Chinese and Burmese and American was what it meant to be American. You know, and I think that realization came to my parents at the same time. See, when I became a judge, they, they gave me this whole big party. We call it an investiture, but basically it's just, it's a party where they do a ceremony and they put the robe on. And, you know, my parents, they came to America with just sort of the simple idea that they wanted a better life for themselves, and really, though, for their kids. So we had this investiture. It was a few months before the pandemic then. And uh, my parents came. And I lost my dad last year. So that was the last time I got to see my father. But during that ceremony, the first thing I said that this is not a story about me. This is a story about them. And my dad, much like you know, many of our Asian dads, was this very strong, stoic, quiet person. And uh, <clears throat> and he wept. I, and I'm not talking about just the, you know, single tear man crying, but he wept openly, loudly. And that has stuck with me. Because, you know, it's like I think he looked out on all of those people, the community leaders, the federal and state judges that had all come out to celebrate his son. And yes, he was proud of me. But I think more than anything, what struck him is that he's not a foreigner with American children. That he too is American. And, uh, you know, I've got three kids. They're, they're, they're here, they're wonderful, and one of them is asleep. And I think about um, what do I want to leave for them? What what kind of America do we want them to have? You know, so, you know, I can't talk about legislation. I can't talk about any of that stuff because I'm a judge and there's rules about that. But what I can tell you is my hopes for them. You know, and you know, my hope, and I end with this, is that maybe, maybe the American dream is more than just a melting pot. Maybe. The American dream is more like this beautiful recipe 
where um, you know where not everything just tastes like one big soup, but that where we can taste the garam masala, where we can taste the five spice, where we can taste the cilantro, the oregano, and all of the various flavors. And it feels daunting to make all those things fit. But that's the beauty of it all. And uh, those are the flavors that make us American. And, you know, I would hope that my children inherit that. And I would hope that our children inherit that. And I would encourage all of these young people, these amazing young people, to consider the law. You know, to consider this is a place where you can make that happen. And uh, that, you know, this is a universe now where the lawyers are the cooks of that ingredient, and the politicians, and you know, various other folks. And, uh, and for us to be involved in that is the most beautiful thing. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. This struggle is real. It's an unspoken, real reality that lots of people don't know what we go through. And before I introduce my next speaker, even as a third generation Asian American, my parents would go shopping in Chinatown and they would save the bags. Whereas the stores that print these names, on a yellow bag with red strokes and characters, and they, they're proud, they're proud of their, their name, their advertising. And here I am, ashamed and afraid and hesitant to use the same bag. My mom would pack my lunch in this yellow, blazing yellow bag with red characters in Cantonese, Dai Wong, Big Wong. And I would be mortified because of all the bags that you could pick, you pick this glaring yellow bag with red characters, and nobody knows what that means. It's not a Walmart bag, it's not a Publix bag, and it, it was really a big struggle. Identity is a struggle for the AAPI community. Uh, let me introduce Andrew McEwen. Andrew Wynn. <laughs> My name is Andrew Wynn. I was born in Orlando in 2004. Um, I'm here because my father endured every hardship and overcame insurmountable adversity in the United States. The law to a society that for us were born to be born is so easy to see. So, this is my father's story. Al Ben Wynn grew up in Saigon during the Vietnam War era, training to become a Catholic priest at the St. Francis in the Seaside of Japan. In a grueling 5.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. daily schedule, he was taught the values of humility, perseverance, and empathy, as well as many academic subjects and practical life skills. However, it quickly became clear that the priesthood was not for him. Uh, he was ju not just a mischief maker at school, he was considered the ringleader of all of the miscreants. They unleashed constant mayhem in the late hours of the night for years until finally, after the carefully orchestrated sabotage of the Eastern Choir performance, my father was finally kicked out of the seminary in 1971. He was 10 years old. I would soon, up, soon end up in another highly structured authoritarian place, the prestigious Junior Military Cadet Academy. This was a military boarding school for Vietnam's best and brightest sons. Again, his life consisted of brutal 15 hour days, this time under the supervision of the Army. There are many parallels between the teachings of the academy and what many consider quintessential American ideology. They taught the importance of self-reliance, compassion, and perseverance. They were sworn to preserve and protect freedom of speech, freedom of religion, basic inalienable rights, and their country. On the other hand, there were differences specific to that time and place. Heavy emphasis was placed on hand-to-hand -hand combat training 
and safety precautions were minimal. The referees, as they were called, were trained to be physically resilient and mentally fearless to the extent that other schools feared playing against them in sports and even the criminal underground due to their clear over This training would be instrumental in overcoming the many adversities my father would face, but it also made him a clear threat to what would become the new communist government of Vietnam. On April 30th, 1975, My father had been evacuated for weeks. My father had been evacuated the weeks leading up to the attack along with all school personnel except for the senior class. He was not there when the school was assaulted by two battalions for the North Vietnamese. Classmates held up for a full day before the academy fell. They were all killed or captured. And they were about the same age as I am now. In Vietnam, fully in the hands of the communists. My father was completely offended. He was military trained, ideologically outspoken, in opposition to the new regime, Catholic, prohibited by the new regime, and his father was a naval intelligence officer in the foreign war. But most importantly, he was still the king's minister. And after setting off firecrackers at his school, he was arrested and counter -reached. My father spent two years in various prisons for re-education camps. Prisoners would be forced to clear the jungle by hand and build their own camp. My father lived in that camp. For disease, snake bite, scorpions, and elephants. Guards casually tortured and murdered prisoners. Friends would not would simply vanish one day, never be seen again. He lived an utterly hopeless time, and how did he not survive? Late one night in July 1977, I eliminated a guard with a grand bear in foot. For an active mind field. And for hours, he was drunk. So he reached a position. From there was a harrowing journey to rural jungle villages in the basements of friends in Saigon, a flight to Phu Phuc Island and back into the jungle, eventually sneaking onto a boat with many other refugees, including women, children, and infants. My father was one of the many boats of the Vietnamese refugees trying desperately to escape, but with nowhere to go. There were 173 people on a 30 foot fishing boat, and as they were denied entry to port after port, food and water ran out, and people began to die. My dad, as one of the younger, healthier survivors, had a grim job of throwing the dead overboard each day. Early morning, November 10th, Texas was set. They reached the shore of Malaysia. The situation was utterly hopeless, and they made the desperate decision to scuttle the boat so that they could not be sent back. Hundreds of feet shore, the boat capsized. I tried to imagine being so near death already from exhaustion, deep vibration, out of nutrition. And suddenly, to have to desperately fight for my life. While all around me, so many were in the same life or death struggle to get to shore, needed help I couldn't give. Of the 173 men, women, and children that set out on that fishing boat a few days ago, 56 people made it to shore. 
and found in Ron's consciousness, woke up at the local village hospital. This is a story of how my father immigrated to the United States. He wasn't granted citizenship. I wanted to. He earned it. He fought communists, was subject to horror, tortured, and nearly killed countless times in his defense of democracy and freedom. He volunteered for the Red Cross throughout Asia until he made it to the U.S. with a legal work visa, making next to nothing as he learned English and achieved his GED. From there, he became a photojournalist for Time magazine playing a pivotal role in exposing human trafficking rights rings in China, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Japan. He followed the trafficking to India and met Mother Teresa, learning for her, a quote, pretend today is your last day and let it be spent helping those who need it most. He took her words to heart and when he returned to America, he worked his way to college, sharing a dorm room with a dozen other guys, but that's a story for another time. He earned advanced degrees in mathematics, physics, aerospace engineering, and business administration. He has pioneered technology and prosthetics that have helped thousands of children throughout the United States and the world. In his spare time, he teaches martial arts to the next generation here in Orlando. And those kids have no idea what Andrew's father went through to be there teaching them and what a privilege it is for the kids and for him. Hal's story wouldn't be complete without mentioning his wife, a refugee with her own story of immigration to America. She wrote the code that now controls how oil and gas flows through 70% of the United States, but that's also a story for another time. Andrew's sister Lucy just graduated from college, and Andrew intends to enlist in the U.S. Marines, and they will have their own story to write. And we will encounter racism, Peers who have only learned that Asian is synonymous with communism spreadsheets and the Kung Flu. Racism isn't born from hatred. It is born from ignorance and grows into hatred. Hal's story and the thousands like it address ignorance before it has a chance to take root. And I thank you for the opportunity to share it today. Thank you, Andrew. Able to share it personally, and I thought Andrew having that connectivity, they are an essential part of our school, and it is a small fraction percentage of what that story actually entailed. It was edited down from like an hour to the, the eight, the six minutes we tried to fit it into. But this is just one of so many remarkable stories. Everyone here knows a story like this, and so this is what this segment was about. We do have a video. This video is uh, by Catherine Lay from Florida Asian American Student Union Video. As you can see, that these accounts and stories are all very personal, very emotional and empowering. So thank you for being so focused.
not able to hear it. And um, we appreciate Kevin Lee and Fazu. And I promise you, I'm going to post this on Facebook and also in an effort to move things along and um, not destroy the video and her message because we're having technical difficulties. We're going to move on to the next segment. And uh, again, thank you all for hanging in there. I know it's a long day. Hopefully, you enjoyed the snacks. I want to thank uh, Jade. Sushi New Asian and Hawkers and New Star Well for providing the snacks and the goodies. There's still cookies and treats, so make sure you get dessert. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to um, Adrian Lee, who's going to do our legislative workshop. So all that activism, all that advocacy, all of the calls to action we've been asking you to do, she is going to lead us to it. Here we go. Adrian, everyone. Well, thank you again to all of our wonderful storytellers for today. Personally, that's one of my favorite aspects of being a part of the community is that there are so many stories and there are so many things that connect us all to one another. I will be so honest in that I held back a lot of tears um, from everyone's stories. So, you know, I hope that the next workshop kind of lightens up, lightens y'all up, you know, get on your feet, write some stuff to our legislators. Um, but yeah, so hello again, my name is Adrian Lee. I have the honor of working with Mimi, Sandra, Dr. Rabella, and all of our other wonderful volunteers for the Make Us Visible Coalition. We have so many volunteers across the state, and one of them actually even drove up from Tampa, so can we give a shout out to Charles? Charles has done so much work in helping us outreach out to our political representatives as we have been trying to really develop a plan of action for the upcoming legislative session. And we've all heard it if you were here at the beginning of the day, talking to representatives, even if it's just an email, even if it's just a quick phone call or leaving a message with the staffer, it goes so much farther than you actually think it would because these people are always in their you know, meetings for their committees, for the Senate or House, wherever they may reside. Um, and no constituent story is too small to share. So that's really kind of the meat and bones of what I'm going to be sharing with you all today. Um, and so this the workshop is titled on legislative advocacy. And at the tables, you'll find that there are some letters and envelopes, as well as some pens. I would invite you all to kind of grab some of those because we are going to be sending letters to our representatives. Yay! So please go grab some of them from the table. Letters. Yeah, they're on all tables, but they're also outside if you'd like to prevent like a line from happening. But please go ahead and grab uh, the the envelope as well. So the letter envelope and pen.
by no means am I an expert. I am merely an engaged citizen, which I hope you all will become after this session as well. How many of you guys have written a letter before? Like a hand letter? Okay. Okay, a good question of you. Okay, that's good. Um, for those of you who have not, you're going to start with your envelope. And in the upper left hand corner, left hand corner, you're going to write your name and your full address. So make sure if you don't have that information, find that information. <laughs> if I were good at jokes, I'd be talking to jokes right now, but I'm not, so you're just probably going to have to be here awkward. Sorry. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so I think most of you have finished by now. You're not going to have to concern yourself with writing out the two since we are going to find that information for you. We just kind of assume that not everyone does their representative, that's fine. So just keep the envelope again with your name and your address. We'll also send it out um, with the postage, so don't worry about that. But now we're going to be starting to write our letters. Um, we've heard it all from our representatives today. It's better if you write a personal story. And as I said, this is really about learning how to share your story and learning how to empower yourself with that story. So I'm going to be spitting out a couple of statistics for y'all. If I'm going too fast, please let me know. Did you know that Asian American communities are the fastest growing voter bloc, according to recent studies from the U.S. Census? Between 2016 to 2019, no other minority group has increased its turnout from one election to the next as much as Asian Americans have. Among adult citizens that are eligible to vote, Asian Americans have doubled their size from 2.5% in the early 2000s to becoming 5% in 2020. The total amount of votes cast by Asian Americans between 2016 to 2020 grew to about 40, 40 to 47%, depending on the study that you're looking at. If you guys would like to use that information in your letters, that would be really great. Um, but if you didn't catch what I said, it's available at the US Census, where all this research data is always available for free. More statistics are according to API Vote. This is a national, nonpartisan group with missions to increase civic engagement across all Asian American communities in the nation. And so there has been a 119% growth rate again. 119% growth rate in API folk, uh, communities between 2000 and 2020. As of 2020, it is estimated that our population size in Florida, in our state of Florida, reaches close to seven, uh, reaches close to over 764,000 folks. However, in 2018, 50% of those Asian American communities received no contact or were unsure if they received any communications from either party. That is still only about four years ago that 50% of Asian American citizens did not have any sort of contact with their representative, with a party, or received any communications to find that information even. So what do those statistics mean for us here in Florida? It means that now is our time to speak. With so much national coverage on Asian American hate crimes that have occurred from the past year and a half, now is the time that more people are willing to listen and to meet with us. So speak loudly. Speak with the assurance that you have all the capabilities to achieve the things that we need as a community. It starts with resources and it starts with education early on. As you all may or may not know, this coalition was raised from the tragedies of the Atlantic Spa shootings. Six Asian women were killed due to one dangerous individual who was guided by racist and harmful stereotypes of Asian American women. Similarly, if you guys have not listened to our student town hall, it is available on YouTube. I highly recommend you all to visit it if you can. It's about an hour length, but you can definitely find different segments here and there of students speaking out about discrimination and bullying that they face in school still. 
simply because of the color of their skin, the shape of the nose, or size of their eyes. Ignorance and hate is still prevalent within our society, but we can rise to this occasion by using our voices to speak out and to speak for. So as we wind down for the rest of the evening, I know y'all are kind of all taking this time to think about your story. And if your story does not mean that you have to be an Asian American to be an ally. But for those of you who are and want to use that in the way that you speak to your legislators, um, this is the challenge, right? Is to discover how is it that we, how is it that I can help contribute to this movement here in Florida. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story in hopes that maybe it also um, inspires some of y'all to think about yours. I am 21. I feel really old in college and in spaces like this, I feel really young. Um, so kind of in that zone where it's like, I'm about to be an adult. <laughs> but if you talk to anyone in my college, I'm also very old. I'm a senior. So I know that's just kind of like, well, you're still very young, but it's my story, right? Like, this is me I'm talking about, what I experienced. In earlier this year, in January, I lost my grandmother to COVID-19. I was not able to be at her bedside. As she left without anyone else in her room to be at her side of her hand. I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't really mean to get to this point, but two months later, that's when news of the anti-spa shootings hit us. And what's more is that we learned that that perpetrator had an intent to, to also come to Florida after what he had done in Atlanta. So two months is definitely not enough time to grieve. I think everyone who has lost someone knows that it takes years. But upon losing my grandmother, I also had to suddenly mobilize and organize an entire vigil that I'm so grateful that some individuals in our in this room today came to support and to be a part of. But that sort of tragedy stays with you. That stories and the stories of those women and the stories of those children stay with you especially. For me, it hurt even more because a lot of these women were Korean. And so for me, I viewed them as my aunties, people I would have known in church or as family friends. As a college student, I've been so fortunate that I've had mentors that challenged me to be more than just who I was, to be a leader, to be kind, to be open-minded, and to develop my own philosophy as a person. Um, they wanted me to grow by serving my community and to constantly challenge myself in the contributions that I have for this world. And I encourage you all to also really reflect on that. What can you do now? What can you do for so many other Asian American communities across the nation that are hurting? Not just in our state, but everyone. And I hope that you use your story as an Asian American or as an ally to challenge our state and to challenge our fate. In Greek mythology, there's this world, there is this word, it's mora. Mora translates to tragedy, and I'm sure that a lot of you know how Greek tragedies tend to go. They always end in disaster or loss, really terribly. But the same word mora also translates to character. The Greek tragedies tell us that your fate belongs to your character, and that your fate is influenced and decided upon your character. But by those who are watching online, who are here today, who have visited the website, sent a, a, an email or phone call to their legislators, you have already demonstrated your character to be one that hopes to empower our communities across the nation. So let this be um, inspiration to you that you have the capability to change the fate of Asian American students who will go through the public education system and hopefully will benefit from a better multicultural learning environment so that they don't have to they, they don't have to wait till college to learn who they are or to begin that reflection. 
please use this, uh, this letter that, again, you hopefully have in your hands to write about who you are and why these bills, both House Bill 281 and Senate Bill 490, to matter to you. Because in the great words of Yuri Koshiyama, who was a, an activist uh, from the early, uh, I believe like 1950s, 1960s, I could be wrong, but don't completely quote me on that. Tomorrow's world is ours to build. And also, that consciousness is power. If we can educate our students from an early age, who go through the K-12 public education system about, about history, about culture, then hopefully that just may lead to a stronger, better state and nation for the rest of us. So, thank you. Please take the rest of your time to work on your letters. Once you have finished, you're welcome to leave them on the uh, tables where you receive them from. It would really help if you kind of folded the letter into words to, uh, to fit into the envelope. But if you're having trouble with that, just please make sure that they are together so we know whose letter belongs to which envelope. And yeah, that's, that's it for my session. It's a little bit short, but thank you all so much for joining us today. It was wonderful seeing everyone. Thank you very much, Adrian. So, um, really excited because Phoebe's letters uh, will get will get them mailed out, and uh, you know these kids, I basically they're my students, so I made them do it, and they all have letters. So, if these kids have letters, that means everybody out there should as well. Uh, I want to thank a bunch of people who may not be here still, but have come through today. From what I've seen, I apologize if I miss anybody, but obviously. Thank you all who are still hanging out with us this whole time. I know it's a long day, but it's been very meaningful to see and hear all of the stories that we shared. So on behalf of Make Us Visible Florida, thank you to all our legislators and the supporting organizations that you see on the screen. If you belong to an organization and you're not on the screen, you need to be. So please let us know uh, if you'd like to be involved. We have an easy Google form for you to fill out. Uh, and I know a bunch of people here have dropped in to say hi. I, again, I apologize if I miss anyone. Uh, Winnie, all the way from Ace Talk down in Miami. Thank you for being here. Asian American Chamber of Commerce, Orange County Asian Committee, um, Asian American Journalists Association, and of course our task forces that are watching from Jacksonville, Tallahassee, and Miami. So all these AAPI organizations, so meaningful that we're here to support this. I would like to recognize our Make Visible Florida volunteers because without them, this doesn't happen. Without help, <laughs> this doesn't happen. Uh, Maureen, Agnes, Selena, Colin, Charles, Jake, Kevin, Sherry, Brandy Pearson, and Julian Alexander. Again, I apologize if I'm missing anybody. I want to <laughs> thank you. Oh, Tom Lynch from the Orange County Sheriff's is here. He's also on our NWCC uh, AAPI task force, so thank you for being here. Thank you to the Wall and Temple Demo team for their performance and all of the work that they're doing today. And now, of course, we our, our photography, our tech team, Sean and Oscar and Sue, and Make Us Visible National team. I cannot do this without their support. They have been instrumental. So thank you to Kate, Jeff, and Dr. Jason Chang, who we all met earlier. Thank you to our food sponsors, Jim Sushi New Asian Hawkers and New Star Well. Did everybody enjoy their treats, I hope? Yep. Yeah. All right, awesome. Last but not least, call to action. Everything Adrian just said, do that and more. So um, call your legislators, as you heard earlier from Senator Stewart and Representative Eskimani. They love hearing from you all, and they want personal accounts. Even if it's three lines, write those three lines, send it in, or even better, call. We have a toolkit available. You can scan the QR code. It'll take you right to that toolkit. You don't have to use the script. You can basically just kind of um, take it as a guideline, but basically it'll connect you to all of your legislators. So please, please call and write. We need to get on that agenda or this bill does not move forward. Uh, this is a coalition. We're not a formal organization. We are just a bunch of really passionate people that want to see this happen. All of this takes a lot of work. We are actually just funding this on our own. So if you'd like to leave any money in the donation box, we would appreciate it. Um, also, Please remember, we also are taking volunteers at any time. Even if you only have one hour for the month, I'll take it. Okay, don't feel like it's a long-term obligation or that you're committed for life and that we're, you know, we're not in a long-term relationship or anything. So even if you just want to pop in and join us for a week, 
or next January, just for a day. We'll take any help we can get. So please, please volunteer with us. Please continue to spread the petition and information on this mega physical corridor legislative bill to include AAP, AAPI history in our K-12 curriculum. That is why we're all here. Follow us on social media, Facebook, and Instagram. I will not make you sit here any longer. I appreciate every one of you being here, especially those of you who decided to help with us earlier in the day. I know it's Saturday afternoon, so it's so meaningful to feel the support and the love for this bill. Thank you all for being here. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs> Bye to our live stream. We're saying goodbye to our live stream. Bye to everybody on Facebook. Sorry, I didn't mean to forget you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap. Please feel free to pick more cookies and leave a donation. <laughs> if you have any questions about history, Dr. Ravel is still back there in the back, ready to share his knowledge. Or if you need help with your letters, uh, let us know. And again, you can leave them on the table and we'll, we'll help you get them to the right place. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.